Today I want to talk to you about science, but the exciting kind that involves explosions and action movie plots. Specifically, I want to talk about bomb trains. Now it used to be when you heard the phrase bomb train, you immediately thought of the Rob Lowe classic, Atomic Train. Rob Lowe. Bring us down! In Atomic Train. But the runaway train destined for Denver is hiding a deadly secret. While Rob Lowe is now stuck pitching cable TV ads, the bomb trains of today are real, and they are also are hiding a deadly secret that they are full of dangerous and explosive oil. In the past two years, eight trains of Bakken crude oil have derailed and exploded. In the worst event so far in Lac Megantic, a runaway train derailed in the middle of a town and killed 47 people. So if this were a movie, we would have a hero on the job who would stop our country from being plagued by these exploding trains, and a villain. And while Rob Lowe may not be rushing to save us, we have a classic villain in the oil industry. It is their oil that is the root cause of these exploding trains, and they are doing everything in their power to keep these trains running to protect their huge profits regardless of the risk. Now to understand this problem, it's best to look at a little history of the oil industry. Edward Drake built the first successful oil well in 1859. In the over 150 years since then, the oil industry has made a whole lot of money understanding all there is to know about oil. Crude oil, like everything else, is made up of billions of tiny molecules. And using the magic of research, oil companies compete with each other in taking the petroleum molecule apart and rearranging it into, well, you name it. So back in 1957, the oil industry was putting out cartoons bragging about their crude oil research. Here's another clip from 1954 from a safety video from the American Petroleum Institute where they explain the correlation between the volatile nature of petroleum and how that makes it flammable and dangerous. It's not the gasoline which burns, it's the vapors of gasoline which burn. That's true of all petroleum products. So that was 1954, when the oil industry obviously knew that all petroleum products were volatile, uh, and that had the potential to make them flammable and dangerous. Here's some more information from the man from 1954. We've been talking about gasoline, but the same things apply to any petroleum product you use on the farm. Kerosene, fuel oil, tractor fuel, diesel fuel, propane, butane, heating fuels, cleaning fluids, even motor oil. When the vapors of any of these reach the right temperature, they will burn. So by using the right temperature in each case, we could repeat our experiments with any petroleum product. To put this whole matter in a nutshell, vapor plus air plus ignition temperature equals fire. And that really is it in a nutshell. When you fill a rail tank car with Bakken crude oil, during transportation, the natural gas liquids come out of the oil, form a layer of vapor on top of the oil within the tank car. And then when there is an accident, as the man from 1954 said, you get fire. But here is the catch. When it comes to Bakken oil and the exploding trains, the oil industry wants you to believe a very big lie. They want you to believe that they simply don't understand what that man from 1954 explained. And so before they can do anything about the exploding oil trains, they have to do years more of research. The phrase the industry likes to use is, the science is still out on Bakken crude. Watch this recent interview between Rachel Maddow and Sarah Feinberg, who's the acting administrator for the Federal Railroad Administration. Maddow asks Feinberg if there's anything that can be done to the oil before it goes into the rail tank cars to make it safer to transport. Is it a hugely expensive or untested or brand new process to try to make that oil uh, less volatile? It's my, my understanding, and I just have a layman's understanding of this, but it's my understanding that there are, there, there's a lot of experience with conditioning the oil basically to make it more stable so it's safer to ship. So I'm not an, I'm not an expert on um, physics and, and taking volatility out of products um, and taking light ends off of products, but it's done in Texas. It's done, in a, it's done, in, it's done elsewhere before it's put into pipelines and before it's shipped. Um, it's certainly a possibility. It can certainly be done, but the, the science is still out. The verdict is still out on what the best way is to treat this product before placing it into transport. Notice how Feinberg said, the science is still out. Now, quite simply, this is a delay tactic, and it is pure bullshit. The oil industry and their surrogates and government want you to believe that they don't understand crude oil. And the media happily reports this as if it isn't patently absurd. Now it's important to note the kind of answer you get when you pose this question to an actual oil scientist. 
which Al Jazeera did when they spoke with a professor of oil engineering at the University of Houston. And he gave a slightly different answer. The notion that this requires significant research and development is a bunch of BS. The science behind this has been revealed over 80 years ago and developing a simple spreadsheet to calculate risk based on composition and vapor pressure is trivial. This can be done today. And in reality, this issue is pretty simple. Bakken oil contains a lot of natural gas liquids when it comes out of the ground. These are things like butane. Butane is very flammable and ignites easily, which is why when you crash a Bakken oil train, you get things like this. Now the government and the oil companies say they need years of research to understand this. Perhaps they should look up this kid and his butane balloon experiments. That kid apparently knows more about how natural gas liquids behave than the Department of Energy and the oil industry, if you take them at their word. So to eliminate the risk that the natural gas liquids pose, the oil industry would have to invest money in equipment that would remove them from the crude oil before it went in the tank cars. And the problem there is that the oil industry would have to invest money. Now the oil industry removes the natural gas liquids and stabilizes the oil before they put it in pipelines or load it onto ocean going tankers. They just don't do it before they put it in rail tank cars because exploding trains don't cost the industry that much and they're just seen as a small cost of doing business. Uh, the industry understands this. Uh, what they're hoping is that you don't understand it so that they don't have to invest in the equipment to make the oil safe before they transport it. Now Feinberg and the FRA weren't the only federal agency carrying water for the oil industry on this issue. The Department of Transportation, the Department of Energy are both playing major roles, as well as a whole host of congressional representatives who are working for the oil industry. This was on display when they all came together for a Congressional Science Committee hearing to discuss Bakken crude oil uh, and what they could do about these exploding trains. Now, before you turn this off thinking, well, this is where the, the geeks and the scientists show up to talk about oil, fear not. The last place in the world you would expect to find an oil scientist would be at a congressional hearing on oil science. If they invited actual oil scientists, the whole thing would be revealed for the sham that it is. Instead, you get a piece of theater, which was a complete embarrassment when you think that this is a congressional hearing on science. Now, one of the stars of the hearing was C Congressman Dana Rohrbacher, uh, who really doesn't like microscopes. And uh, I, uh, I, when I look and see how people in North Dakota are living now and what this means to people, ordinary people's lives, again, we should be thanking God rather than sending out an army of regulators to try to find and using a microscope to find out any excuse to put a roadblock in the way and try to stop this uh, wonderful gift that we have from being utilized to upgrading people's lives in our country. So uh, that's the number one point. To sum up Congressman Rohrbacher's approach to science, I think we could say, hey, let's all thank God and stop asking so many questions. And unfortunately, that was not the low point of the science committee hearing which started with Chairwoman Loomis reading a prepared statement. And today's DOE written testimony states that more scientific analysis is needed to better define the relationship between volatility and ignitability slash flammability. The Science Committee will be interested to hear about the results of DOE's research as it progresses. Now the real star of the whole hearing was Congressman Brown, who started off with a statement that appeared quite promising because we're interested in the science behind Bakken crude. Congressman Brown then attempted to read his prepared statement, and it appears he could have used a little more coaching from the lobbyist who wrote it. Is a claim about ignitability and flammability a scientific assessment that is, or they some not, or they Eventually, we get to some actual scientific explanations, where Mr. Butters of the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration explains the relationship between volatility and ignitability. Watch how Congressman Brown responds to an actual scientific explanation. And so as a, a flammable liquid has a higher pro propensity to vaporize, then it introduces, uh, it, it has a higher likelihood of ign ign ignitability because of the, the low pressure. Uh, Can you answer yes or no to this question? I don't get one. I'm, well, I'm trying to answer the okay. question. 
I've got limited time. I've got several questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, obviously, you can't answer it. Congressman Brown then uses his limited time to move on to the next witness, Christopher Smith of the Department of Energy. Watch how the congressman refers to Mr. Butters' prior testimony, where Mr. Butters gave him an actual scientific explanation. The fence of conclusion, what we heard this uh, mumbo jumbo from Mr. Butters. Uh... That's right. At an actual Congressional Science Committee hearing, one of the co-chairs of the committee dismisses a scientific explanation he was given to a question that he asked as mumbo jumbo. Y'all continue. Okay. Y'all asked that there be more scientific analysis. That's correct. Uh, that, that is what we're undertaking. Okay. That's correct. correct. And, and it's the discussion between the volatility versus the ignitability and flammability. You see that as two different issues yeah. from your own written statement, whereas Mr. Butters is saying they're basically one and the same. So y'all well, contradict each other. I, I, I did not. Do you agree with that? I, I did not hear him say they're one and the same. But that is because he didn't say they are one and the same, because they are not, just like mumbo is different from jumbo. Then Mr. Smith went on to once again explain the science to Congressman Brown. Volatility, as Mr. Byers explained, is the propensity of the material to vaporize. So that's your lighterants coming out of the crude. Ignitability and flammability are properties of the material in terms of their, their propensity to ignite, to, to, to catch fire, uh, or to, to burn. And thus the committee was treated once again to an actual scientific explanation uh, to the questions they were asking, uh, which obviously Congressman Brown does not want to hear. Now, as a fan of science, I thought having a U.S. Senator throw a snowball in Congress to apparently try to disprove climate science was sure to be a historic low point for scientific discussion within the halls of Congress. But Congressman Brown is definitely in the running now with what he proposes next. So the water vaporizes yeah. too, so it's not ignitable. So it's two different things here. Is and, and, the, and that's that's right. The congressman wanted to point out that water vaporizes, and and since it does, and since water is known to be not flammable, that if something vaporizes, obviously that shouldn't make it flammable. And he does have a very good point that water is not flammable. Uh, which I guess is why science can get so confusing for some people. That is, are they some not, are they? Now, although the Department of Energy certainly is to blame for their position that more research is required to understand how crude oil behaves, Mr. Smith of the DOE is under oath at this hearing. So listen to how he explains what the DOE knows about the relationship between volatility flammability and ignitability is when it comes to crude oil? Uh, we think that in a, in a, in a laboratory setting uh, for crude oil, higher volatility is going to be uh, consistent with higher light ends, which do have a higher degree of flammability and volatility. There you go. That, that wasn't that hard. It's the actual science explained because it is known. Of course, it was qualified by the statement in a laboratory setting. Let's see what else Mr. Smith has to say. Uh, so we're, we're going through right now that statement of work, which essentially is going to be able to allow us to offer more precise questions to the question you just asked, which is in the real world, uh, with a real rail car, with a real derailment, with a real fire, uh, what would be the, the relationship between vapor pressure, volatility, ignitability, flammability. Uh, those are some things that we haven't done, uh, again, in, in, in real practical applications, so we need to move from the lab to uh, kind of the, the real world laboratory of, of real rail cars. And so there it is. The Department of Energy will need several more years to study this issue to find out what happens when you crash a Bakken oil train in the real world. Because right now, all they know is what happens in a laboratory setting. They claim they have no idea what happens when you crash one of these trains in the real world. There is one final part to this story. The Department of Energy recently announced the scope of the research they're planning to do. And they've announced that they will not be funding any real-world testing, the testing that Mr. Smith said was so important. However, they have said that if the oil industry wants to fund that testing, that they are open to that. But it is up to you. It's up to each of you individually to answer the question. Will petroleum be your servant or your destroyer? 
the answer depends upon how carefully you handle petroleum products